Uh, hi everyone, I'm Jonathan Sadlofer. I haven't been around much um, this particular season, but I will be coming back and uh, uh, I help run the center for, uh, see how long it's been? I don't do anything with this. No. Crime Fiction Academy. Nuri Tomasi, who's over there, actually runs the Center for Fiction. And if you don't know the Center for Fiction, um, there are so many amazing events, workshops, storytellers, writing events. I mean, it's just it's endless, and you should check the website. Um, there is another mystery writer, Hank Filippi Ryan, who's coming. Uh, but there's many, many writers and terrific things that you should look at and try and get here. Um, hold on, I need my notes. <laughs> you They're very everything. short. You don't know everything happening. I do, in fact. <clears throat> yes, because one of the things I do, I was going to say I'm a very good student, but the truth is I was always a very poor student, which I point out to people that you act, you, you can do better as you grow up. But um, but I because I'm not a great student, I, I did, a, even though I know Lisa, I, I spent hours sort of, you know, combing the internet about Lisa. <clears throat> and so I do know things that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> that sounds, well, anyhow. This is going to be, it's going to be, uh, my introduction will be very brief, and then Lisa and I will have a conversation, and, and I will basically interview Lisa, and then you will get a chance to ask your questions. But now you'll see all of my research boils down to this. Lisa Unger is an award-winning New York Times and internationally best-selling author. Her novels have sold over 1.75 million copies. She's been translated into 26 languages. Now, one of the things I noticed, of course, and I could read you all the things that the press has said about her, and they're all great, and nobody ever really puts their bad press on their website, so. <laughs> but rather than do, no, I'm not gonna read, there is no bad press that I know. What I thought I would read, just very three little things, because they're by other crime fiction writers about Lisa Unger, and I thought <clears throat> that was kind of great. So Lee Child, who's been here, said, Lisa Unger's writing is suspenseful, sensitive, sexy, and subtle. I like the alliteration, too, right? <laughs> Lisa Gardner said, Lisa Unger's taut prose grabs the reader from word one and never lets go. And I like John Connolly's comment uh, because Harlan Coben was here. And John Connolly says, Harlan Coben has a new rival for his thriller crown. And I just wish Harlan Coben were in the room, because <laughs> Harlan Coben's about 6'4", and I think, and he's very loquacious, so I, it would be an interesting moment. So um, with that, though, uh, Lisa Unger, who is here from, <laughs> here from, here from her home in Florida. So. I'm supposed to, oh, there we go. Wow, good. That good. And I actually made the microphone work. Good. <laughs> Without too much help. You know, um, I knew of Lisa and I had I'd read her, a few of her books and I just wanted to put a sort of plug because the way I got to know Lisa was, and I was thinking about it today, is I helped put together this serial novel, <clears throat> which is a kind of exquisite corpse thing, where, uh, how many writers? 20 writers. Um, had to follow continue, a continuing story. And, you know, <clears throat> when you're doing a project like that, some people are so wonderful, and some are not. <laughs> <laughs> and Lisa was, I mean, no, really, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have even brought this up if Lisa were not in the first category, but she was so extraordinary, and so generous, and so fun, to work with, um, and it just, I will say that one of the things that, I, I've done a few anthologies, I've done an anthology with S.J. Roseanne, who's sitting here, and who's also in this book, and next to her is Alifair Burke, who's also in this book, of course they're in the first category, no question, you know. Yeah, right. Um, in any case, it, it, uh, you really do get to know another writer in a different way because you um, are working back and forth with them and you see how 
they are either incredibly cooperative or not, and what it means to collaborate when you're writing. So I felt as if I knew Lisa uh, before I met her in that way. This is her new book, which we're gonna talk about a little, and which hopefully you will go and buy at the end of this and have Lisa sign it for you. Um, so, a couple of questions, nothing. You've been on, Lisa's been on a three month book tour. On and off, yes, three, three months. Yeah. It's, a, it's a long time for an introvert to be on the road. Are you introverted, really? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think as a writer, you probably would have to be to a certain degree. I mean, you have to sort of access your inner introvert to, you know, get yourself out there. And, you know, I have access to that part of my personality, but. I think, you know, there's a lot of misconception about introverts in general, like, you know, it's like they're very shy or you can't speak in public or any of those things. Th that's not me. It's just that I'm nourished by, by solitude, by time at my, my keyboard, and I am, you know, sort of drained by being on the road, which is not to say that I don't also like it. So it's like this kind of, you know, it's just one feature of my very sort of disturbed and schizophrenic personality. But, you know, obviously there's always something a little bit wrong with you to begin with, or it wouldn't be a writer. So it's just a matter of managing all your various pathologies. Yeah, you know, uh, I like that. Yeah. Uh, it brings up so many different things, which I don't have on this paper, but the idea that, uh, one thing I was gonna say is that if you read The New Yorker, the art critic Peter Sheldahl has said that all artists, writers, performers are somewhat broken in some way, and so they're always trying to cre recreate the world as a perfect place. Yeah, I like that. I think that's true. I mean, I think most writers, and there's probably a lot of writers in this room, um, aspiring writers and, and published writers as well, but I think that most of us will acknowledge that we were born and, and not made. Certainly that's the way I feel about myself. I don't remember a time before I thought of myself as a writer. I, I was writing long before I was published, and I'll be writing if, I never, if I'm never published again. I mean, it's just you know, part of who I am. And I think you know, most of us who are writing have that, you, know, you have that germ, you have that desire early on, and you, know, you, kind, of, you kind of know what's, that there's something wrong with you, that it's almost like a disease. And hopefully you, you, know, you figure it out early enough, otherwise maybe you wind up institutionalized. <laughs> rather than publish, and um, I think that, you know, it's just sort of, I, I like that idea that there's, you know, that you're, you know, you perceive a lot of, as an observer, which again, you know, I think is something that is innate, um, you know, you perceive a lot that's broken within and without, and fiction is sort of a way to metabolize some of the, you know, some of the chaos. Yeah, that I think that's around us. No, no, that's no, okay. No, I think that's great. I, I, it, it's sort of the, um, you know, Lee Child says in the, in the introduction of this book, and I think this is something I discovered in the crime fiction writing world, that, that, that there is a kind of collegial, and I mean, so many of the crime fiction writers are just great. You know, they're just yeah, so wonderful really and generous. And I came out of the art world, and I would not say that about the art world. Right. But I, I do think that, and I, the, my theory, and, and I think Lee says it, is that, that writers like you, uh, though that is not part of you, you get certain things out on the page. You know? Right. It's, a, it's sort of a, you know, a metabolizing of fear. You know, I think that um, you know, a lot of us, you know, when you look around at, at the world that we live in, um, you know, there's a lot that's broken. There are a lot of things wrong. And I think, and maybe, I, I don't think I'm speaking for myself when, you know, I say that there's a tremendous amount of anxiety involved in that, especially when you're a parent, you know, when you have people in your life that you love and that you're responsible for, you know, you see the world as kind of a big, very dark place. And, um, you know, in real life, there's nothing you can do about that, you know things go very wrong and justice is not always served and um, you know people are hurt and broken and, and never fixed um, but within the pages of a book you can order that chaos you can create a world in which there is you know justice and it may not be you know sort of the traditional kind of justice where the criminal is jailed and you know um, people go on to mend themselves but maybe even a poetic justice or some kind of an emotional justice 
and you can um, you can start a story, a dark story, and um, and bring it to its conclusion, and then you can also um, explore the human psyche in a way, especially in crime fiction, that maybe other other areas of fiction writing you can't do as well. You can explore the human psyche and try to answer for yourself this question. You know what's wrong? What's wrong with people? <laughs> you know, which is, I think, I think every single one of my books is me trying to figure out, you know, what is wrong? You know, and I kind of, um, I consider myself a like a spelunker. You know, it's like I'm kind of like shimmying myself into these dark, you know, not necessarily safe places because I want to know, you know, what makes the world dark and how it might be. Fixed. Do you think um, that generally that, I mean, I think people come to crime fiction for many reasons, but do you think one of those the reasons is to look at that dark world that you've created, but that you've constructed, and that they're going to get thrilled, but that they also know that you're going to fix that? Or right, yeah, that? absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, when you write about crime, you know, you're writing about people on, you know, on the worst day of their lives. And when you're, you know, when you're in, in crime, sort of in violence and in darkness is kind of like a crucible. And so when pressure is applied to the human psyche, um, that's when it truly reveals itself. Um, and so I think that, you know, if you have questions or if you perceive sort of a darkness in the, in the universe and you want to explore that, I mean, that's where you go to crime fiction. I mean, I don't think I chose to write about crime any more than I chose to write in the first place. You know, I've always just sort of had this really dark, you know, twisted imagination, you know, from the time I was really little. And I don't know whether it's just because, you know, at first and foremost, you know, I'm a, obviously a reader, you know, I fell in love with the story in the pages of, you know, somebody else's book. And, um, you know, I was recently asked to write for the Huffington Post a list of my, my favorite thrillers. And it's a, it's a pretty, kooky and, and diverse list, like everything from Cujo to Jane Eyre, you know, because <laughs> they all have something about them that, that formed me. But I mean, I read a lot of really dark stuff, you know, at a really inappropriately young age. You know, my parents were just like, you know, they thought, well, if she can read it, you let her read it. And uh, most of that stuff is going to go over her head. Um, but, you know, didn't. <laughs> so I was, you know, eight, reading things like Cujo and, and Flowers in the Attic and, you know, um, anything anything dark and, and horrible that I could get my hands on. And, it, and I don't know whether I was drawn to it because I was already afraid or if it was just, I want, like, I lived in the light. You know, my life, my, I grew up. You know, I don't have anything more than the most like banal dysfunction in my past. You know, I don't have any trauma or, you know, secret horrors. You know, so maybe it was because, uh, you know, as a young person and even now in my adult life, you know, I live in the light. It's safe for me to, you know, peer behind the curtain. You know, and I'm like the girl who's, you know, in the movie heading down the stairs, you know, to find out what's that noise? And everybody in the theater's like, get out, get out. Pretty much, that's the story of my life, more or less. <laughs> no, I, I like that. I, I think most uh, most crime fiction writers were always attracted to the dark. Yeah. You know, and liked to be scared. Yeah, you because there's be a thrill. There's a thrill. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. there's a thrill to that. You know, because you are in a safe place, and you know, and I think too, when you're, you know, especially when you're a young person, at least for me, you know, I just had all these kind of big feelings. You know, like these big emotions and this big imagination. And I lived in like, you know, New Jersey, like <laughs> you know, Long Valley, New Jersey, like suburban, like we used to call it, we used to call it Lost Valley. <laughs> you know, and I lived in this kind of, you know, sort of dull, um, well most of the time dull place. And I think that, you know, I was looking for something bigger. You know, I was looking for something bigger until I until I actually found it because um, when I was uh, when I was 15 um, in that town, which was like sort of an idyllic place to grow up, or the kind of place where, you know, your family um, moves you to be safe. A girl I knew, a 15-year-old girl, was abducted and, and murdered. 
And um, that story was sort of the, was something that stayed with me. Like that was a thing that really greatly affected the way I saw the world. I mean, it was a, it never really been exposed to anything except fictional violence. And then to have somebody that you knew, not that she was a close friend of mine, but she was certainly somebody that, you know, we played in the school orchestra together. You know, she was, um, you know, the victim of a, a horrific crime. And we were, you know, we were not shielded from that in any way. Um, and we were sort of front row seat to that investigation as it unfolded. And it's not something that, you know, haunted me necessarily, but it is certainly something that stayed with me and that I went back to again and again until I was finally able to resolve that story, my part of it to tell into, into a novel, and that was, that was fragile. So, you know, it's kind of a combination of those two things. I mean, sort of a, a perfect storm of, you know, it was already looking for the darkness, and then I found it. Yeah, so it's yeah. not what you want to find. But no. Brian did read that um, Rebecca, Daphne Rebecca. du Maurier, was yeah. an early uh, novel that you loved. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that was definitely my, my first real thriller. You know, and it is. I mean, has anybody, has everybody read it? Or anybody read it? Or you've yeah, seen I mean, the Hitchcock movie. Or you've seen the movie, it, of course. It, so and it's ready. like, you know, the, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a theme that, you know, I sort of, whatever, you never know this stuff until after the fact, but it's a, a theme I see through my own work, which is like the sort of ordinary girl caught in, you know, these extraordinary circumstances and, you know, how she performs and how it sort of becomes a, a coming of age for, for that character. And I think that, you know, I mean, talk about a big purple story, yeah. right? I mean, like the ultimate in everything from mystery to romance to, you know, um, intrigue and, you know, um, a beating heart of just thrills, right. you know, certainly a, a very, a very early influence for me. You, um, I'm going to now, <clears throat> because you talked about ordinary women in, in extraordinary circumstances, and I think uh, the protagonists that you've created are all sort of strong, tough hmm. women. Uh, you might call them ordinary women, but they are sort of really strong characters. Um, and I read the following statement, which you said. Uh -oh. <laughs> You said, I didn't really expect to have male readers in the first place. Oh, did I say that? Yeah. God. And so <laughs> I, saw, I, I, I read this interview, and uh, yeah, the interviewer asked you about that. So yeah. So I was going to say now. Sorry, boys. <laughs> well, it's mainly because men can't read. Right. You know that, but, uh, I wasn't going to say that. No. But, uh, <laughs> But is that true that you didn't expect to have male readers because you were writing about women? It's like the Hollywood thing where um, they don't do movies about women because they don't think women can carry a movie. Do you know this? Mm, we know it. Yeah. We, know it. <laughs> we know it. Yeah. You know, I have to say that I didn't expect to have like any readers. <laughs> you know, other than my grandma and uh, you know my mom. I mean, I honestly, you know, I am. Um, you know, even though like I never wanted to do anything else, I never thought I would be able to make my living as a as a writer, and mainly that's because it's what my dad told me. <laughs> you know, and he basically said, "Wow, that's such a nice hobby, but you should really get a job because I paid for your education, and uh, that was really nice of me. But now, <laughs> you please don't you know move home." to write your first novel or, you know, travel around Europe to find yourself, you know, go to work. So, I mean, I kind of had this very, you know, I'm this humility about the whole thing where I was just like, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I certainly didn't have the confidence to do it at that point anyway. So I did the only thing that I could do at that time with a, you know, with a bachelor's degree in, you know, English and creative writing, I went into publishing. I know, I was going to ask you. Yeah, so I am, um, you know, so I went into, I went into publishing and, you know, went into publicity. And unfortunately, you know, I was very good at my job. You know, it was a big problem because my job kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the time I spent writing got smaller and smaller and smaller. And until I had an epiphany and I, I realized, you know, you know what, you're going to have to look back at yourself five years, ten years from now and say, you never even tried to do it. And I figured I could live with sort of a spectacular crash and burn failure 
um, but I wasn't going to be able to live with a slow fade to nothing. So I got um, really serious about my writing at that point, and I, you know, over the next year I finished my first novel, which I began when I was 19, when I was still in college, and I finished when I was 29 years old. So 10 years, if you need me to do the math for you. <laughs> and, uh, not, a long, not a long book, you know, not especially long or, you know, anything like that. So um, just the, you know, what happens to all of us, I think, you know, it's like this is a big dream. It's a huge dream to have this, to want this for yourself. And, you know, I think a lot of us are, you know, pretty shy of that dream, you know, to say, mm, I don't know if I can do it. But I at least said to myself, I'm going to finish that. I'm going to finish that book. So I did finish the book and I shelved it. And, you know, at that point, I was just happy to have achieved that accomplishment of finishing the first novel because that's a huge accomplishment to do that. And, um, and I never expected anybody to read it, not male or female, you know. <laughs> and maybe people shouldn't have read it, but it was published eventually. And that was the first of uh, 12 novels in, in, in The Blood is number 12. Do you think that your, I mean, it's an obvious question, but do you think the, your work in publishing prepared you or helped you in some ways for a writing career at all? Well, it did. It didn't actually help me get published, Yeah. unfortunately. Um, but actually, maybe fortunately, because if I had been published by the company for which I worked for almost 10 years. Not that I'm bitter. I, I, think, I think it would have been less of a, you know, it would have always felt a little bit like, oh, well, you work there, and of course right. they publish your book, you know, because people are always looking to level you, you know, that's like a big thing that happens. Um, but, um, uh, what was the question? Well, I just wondered. <laughs> mean, oh, yes, of course it did. Well, how it helped me was that, you know, once I, I, I had, you know, extremely low expectations, Always you know, good, right? and so I was never disappointed, you mm -hmm. know. I think that when, when aspiring writers are, are working towards that goal of getting published, um, they, they see it as an end, of, an end to something. This is the end to my journey. This is my windfall. This mm -hmm. is like the big publishing contract I have achieved this goal, and from here on out, it's all like roses and champagne and victory laps. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I knew, going to having been a publicist, that I knew that it was really, it was time to roll up my sleeves and get to work. You know, it was time to write another book. It was time to, um, you know, figure out how I could promote myself, what I could do for myself. And, you know, I had, you know, that first, that early deal with St. Martin's, which was a two-book deal, basically, you know, it was like, a nickel and a cheese sandwich, you know, like don't quit your day job, which, you know, P.S. I already had, you know, like, you know, don't quit your day job, but, you know, here we'll throw this book out and see what happens to it, and, um, and I knew that, you yeah. know, and I was kind of okay with that, so I also knew, and I always get, this always gets tweeted when I say it, and it's really not as negative as it I mean, sounds, it's, okay, get your foot down, yeah. I also knew that it was harder to succeed as a published writer than it was to get published in the first place. Mm. So I think knowing that when I walked into it, it saved me from a lot of a lot of uh, disappointment. Because I, you know, when people walk into the process and they, you know, they have a romance about the idea of publishing, um, I think that it's kind of painful when it goes another way. I think that, um, and I've I, I've said this to many people. I've said it to students, and I think what what you're talking about, I, I've in my life, my art life, I would say to people, yes, if you work at it, yeah. you will get that show, no question. And if you work really hard and you have some, you'll, you'll, you'll publish the book. Right. It's just the beginning of a new set of problems. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Right. But it's not it negative. Is, it doesn't, you haven't, it isn't, that's not the end note. It's just, right. yeah. It's, it's the early note. Right. You know, it's the foot in the door. You know, to think that, you know, and certainly there are people who go out the gate with their first book and it's a huge big bestseller and, you know, all of that. Um, and, you know, maybe there's another book, maybe there's not. But, you know, certainly there is that. Um, but it's anomalous. So for, the, for most of us, you know, we're sort of nose to the keyboard, you know, out there working hard in every possible way all the time. Um, and that should be okay. Because, um, especially when you're at the the point of being aspiring to working to get published, your goal, your main goal, 
should be the same as it is for me now, which is every day I sit down at my keyboard and I think, today I can be a better writer than I was yesterday. And that's what gets me up in the morning, and that's what, you know, is the, is the, is the belly of fire that every day I know I can be better than I was yesterday. And I believe that. What and about I, the days when you feel like you might be worse? Then I just go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think then I cry at my keyboard. <laughs> well, you know, I'm being, I'm being funny, but I'm yeah. not because I, uh, you know, it's sort of like people think, and I know you would not take to your bed that you would No, I writing. wouldn't. I would so just keep no. writing. So that's, <laughs> but, that, but that's the thing. Yeah, that's but that's the thing. The thing. Because you have to do that. I have to do right? it. You yeah. know, and I think that in the process of getting published, I think people forget that what you have to do is write a good book. You know, and if you've written a first draft and it didn't get published, then you need to rewrite the first draft and you need to rewrite it and you need to rewrite it. And when you can't rewrite it anymore, you need to write something else. And if you, if you need to do this, if you want to do this, if it is in your, your gut to do this, then that's what you will do. Um, the way anybody will, you know, perpetually drive themselves towards a goal, publishing should be incidental to getting better at what you do because everything flows from that place. Everything flows from the work, you know, and that is true, you know, even after you're published. It's like, you know, everything we do, we get out on the road, we go on the social networks, we try to, you know, create exposure as much as we can. But, you know, nobody ever created demand for their work. The work creates demand for itself. And that's a hard thing to, that's a hard thing to get your head around. No, but it's very important. And I, I know at Crime Fiction Academy, there was maybe the first semester group that we had, and, and people were always talking about getting published. And I said, you have to ask yourself the question, would I do this if I was not gonna get published? Right. You know, I mean, it's a basic that thing. Do you question. love doing this work? Do you want to do this work? You know, right. um, it better be for love. Yeah, because there's no, there's no other guarantee, reason. and right. uh, you know all of that. So, I'll, so since you were talking about revisions and revisions, let me. I'll ask you the regular technical question. Now, you don't outline at all, right? I do not. So, uh, so you're an intuitive writer, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, you, you let the guide the book and the characters guide you through it. Yes. I am, you know, my process is, is, is well, it's not bizarre. It seems bizarre to some people, um, but except for people who write that way. Um, but for me, you know, the germ for a novel, the seed for a novel could come from almost anything. It could come from a, you know, a news story or a line of poetry or even a piece of junk mail in the case of one book. And, um, you know, those, um, those moments, those like sort of little zaps, which is hard to explain in any other way. Like the, the you get this feeling like, oh, you know, wow, I wonder. And what it does is it leads to kind of a cavalcade of questions that that I might have. And the best way that I can explain it is if it then connects with something larger that's going on within me. Then I'll either start researching um, a topic that interests me, or and this is where it gets weird. I start to I start to hear voices. So I'll either hear a voice, something said, over and over, a you know, a sentence, a line, or I'll see something over and over again, you know, until I get, you know, get it onto the page. And it's from that place, it's from that seed that the, that the novel flows. So my feeling is that um, plot and everything else flows from character. So I have to write my way into the character. It's generally one voice. Um, one main voice, although there may be many other voices that I access later, it's usually one one person that draws me through the through the narrative of the book. And you know, it's an act of faith. You know, I've written twelve novels this way. I, I thirteen novels, thirteen going on fourteen novels this way. And um, you know, I sort of get into um, you know get into that headspace and start to write. It's a very internal, um, uh, subconscious process for me to the degree where a lot of times I'll go back and, and read what I've written and not remember having written it. Um, or, you know, I'll write something and not really understand why it's there until 100 pages later when I'm like, oh, that's why it's there, you know, or, you know, there's a lot of time just spent going, 
you know, at the computer going. <laughs> so I wonder, you know, if anything's ever going to happen again. You know, I, I hope it is. And then, you know, you get up and you go on the treadmill and like, oh, there it is. You know, or you go to sleep at night and you wake up at 3 a.m. You're like, that's it. You know, and that's pretty much how every book gets written, which is kind of a, yeah. you know, kind of a crazy way to write a book. You know, very, it can be very stressful. Luckily, my, well, my husband, Jeff, is, you know, he's there year after year for the, for the process. But he told me he locks your office so that you can't go out. <laughs> <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that what you said? Oh, sorry. Say that. Um, that's what I tell people about me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's, well, he knows all the, um, he's got all the, you know, the, he's got a patient look that I, that I know. <laughs> where I'm like, you know what? It's, it's a, I'll be like 75% through the book. I'll be like, you know what? The book I have written, the book that I am working on, it sucks. <laughs> and do you know what's even worse than that? I am not good enough to make it better, so it's going to continue to suck forever, and I'm not going to be able to fix it. And he's like, I know. I know. So <laughs> we just need to, we just need to go, go to the gym, you know, go do something, you know, make chili, do whatever it is that you need to do. And you're going to get through this. And I'm, every time I'm like, no, you don't know me. You don't know how this works. Oh, yes. you, you can't understand. And he's like, I know. <laughs> Which is, you know, angering in its own way. But <laughs> and then I'm always like, you know, you talk about like, oh, you know, you get kicked out of the manuscript. Like, it kicks me out sometimes, you know? And you're just like, Oh, it kicked me out. You know, it's never going to let me back in. And it takes, like, you know, something else, and then you're back in. And it's good to have somebody who kind of, yes. you know, knows all your various neuroses and, you know, freak out points. Well, I, don't tr I really don't you. trust any kind of artist that don't have that and don't feel that complete right. emptiness and terror. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. I, I, no, I, I know. When I, know. I meet writers and people, and they say, yeah, my so you you talked a little bit about research, did, yeah. and so that helps you into your books. And then there are times you yeah. stop, step back to do research, or and yeah. how it keeps you going, or doesn't, or how much, or how little, and all that. Well, yeah. I mean, um, in the case of um, uh, in the blood, which is a good example of this, is that uh, it was inspired by an article in the New York Times magazine. And um, there's a doctor in Florida who believes that, you know, the, um, there are plenty of people who believe that a fledgling psychopath can be identified as early as the age of five. And it's kind of a slippery area. You know, the human mind is the, is the ultimate mystery, and the mind of a child is more mysterious still. And, um, you know, there's a lot of growth that happens in the brain, and brain chemicals change, and, you know, um, brains grow and people who are young and exhibiting very disturbed behavior sometimes grow up and there's nothing. You know, they're perfectly normal. That wasn't the case for my husband. <laughs> Sorry. He had a smirk. He asked for it, I'm just gonna say. So listen you're getting a lot of air time. <laughs> And um, so this idea, and, and he created a, a school, which is kind of the last stop for a few of these kids that are, you know, the, um, the, the phrase for it is callous, unemotional children. They are raging, they, are, um, they lack empathy, they are um, hurting people and, you know, and animals and whatnot. And, uh, you know, so he created the school thinking that if he could intervene early, like you can't teach a sociopath or a psychopath to feel but you can, he believes, teach them to mimic empathy, which is what they are. They're mimics. You know, they don't have any real inner life. There's no emotion. There's no conscience. Um, there's no place for that to ever grow. There's no attachment. But, you know, he thinks that the U.S. is breeding more psychopaths than any other country in the world. And he thinks that if you could at least introduce the idea of empathy early, you could maybe, possibly, change the behavior. Um, anyway, so he creates this school, and you know, my takeaway from the article, and I'm not saying that it is exactly what was there, but it was just that it's not working. And that these kids are together in a school, and you know, they are learning from each other, they are um, they're manipulating each other, they're preying on each other, and you know, even though this is kind of a, 
a difficult, sad, and, and tragic situation for me. <laughs> it was very interesting, very interesting. So I started doing a lot of reading on this topic, and um, I, uh, I wound up um, hearing the voice of Lana Granger, who is the protagonist in The Blood. And when I started writing about Lana, um, the only thing I knew about her was that she was a liar and that she had told so many lies about herself and about her life that um, she didn't even know what the truth was anymore. And uh, the other thing that I came to understand about her as I wrote is that she had kind of wrapped herself up in this, you know, psychic cocoon and that she would begin the novel as one thing and that she would emerge as another thing altogether. I didn't know what that was. And so I had to find my way. I mean, I had to find my way there. Yeah, but, I was going to ask yeah. you about lying because it comes up in other novels as it well. Does. And I thought, I mean, I was going to say, most in your most recent, in Lana Granger, is when you know, yeah. lies about everything. Yeah. You know, so I wondered, has lying been something that's of interest to you to write about to explore? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a theme that sort of runs through my work as well. I mean, just the kind of the idea of the liar and what, and all the many different people all the many different reasons why people lie um, and why we actually all lie in, in little ways and in big ways and why we lie to ourselves and why we lie to the people that we love and not only that but why do we believe the lies that are told to us. Um, I think that you know it's definitely a, a topic that I, I tend to delve into sort of over and over again just because it's it's fascinating to me you know the um, the the ease with which some people do it, you know, and um, and you're lying now. Right. <laughs> well, I I'm always lie. I'm a professional liar. Right. And that's what I do. Um, <laughs> can I just add one thing that I know people are always interested in? And so you've had um, uh, Ridley Jones, Lydia Strong, and you've even made a place be a series, The Hollows. Right. And what, um, like, how do you, you know, when do you know? A series is over if it is uh, what it gives you you know for right. each book um, how you know if it sets up uh, problems or if it sets up a kind of ease for you right well I am um, the the first four books um, uh, were about Lydia Strong who's a true crime writer and um, she had kind of a dark past and um, she was a, 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 tor a torture character and she sort of had this work as, you know, speaking about metabolizing fear, order and chaos. She had this crime in her past and she had turned to this profession of crime writing to kind of order the chaos that she perceived in the world. She spent a lot of time chasing monsters and a lot of times those monsters would turn around and chase her and, you know, that series ended when um, Lydia was approaching happiness which is a good place to end. You know, otherwise you're just being mean to your, <laughs> to your character. Yeah, but, uh, serious characters get a lot of yeah. bad stuff. No, really mean things yeah, happen yeah, to yeah. them. And then... Um, and you wrote those under a pseudonym. Oh, uh, my maiden name, Lisa Michonne. So I did. And then um, in between the third and the fourth book in that um, series, I wrote another book. Um, this is before I had a, a child, when I could still do that. <laughs> and uh, so I wrote another book, a book that kind of was, you know, it was the junk mail book. It was inspired by, it was inspired by a piece of junk mail, and, uh, Beautiful Lies. And uh, in between those two books, I wrote this book featuring a protagonist by the name of Ridley Jones. And I did, I got this flyer in the mail, and um, it was a, you know, one of those advertisements, and, and we've all seen them. There's an ad on, on one side, and then on the picture, there's, on the back, there's a picture of a, a missing child. And in this case, it was an age-graduated photograph, and I thought, what if I you know, looked at this and recognized myself? And that was the germ for Beautiful Lives. Although my parents will always say that it was my 500-page fantasy on how I'm not really their child. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, of course, is not true at all. Um, but I, um, I, that, so that book sprung from a very you know, deep place, and I really, um, had to write it, like it, ha it had to be written. So I wrote it, and uh, my publisher at the time, St. Martin's, you know, they, they didn't want it. They wanted the fourth book in the series, and they didn't want Beautiful Lives. And I thought, huh, now, okay, so that's not a good day, okay? <laughs> I'm just gonna say, that's a bad day. Um, so I had a, um, a wonderful agent at the time, and she said, well, you know, 
it's time for us to move on anyway. She said, finish your, your fourth book, which I, you know, very much so wanted to write as well. And uh, she's like, and we will, um, we will find the perfect editor for this book. And are you still here, Sally? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Sally came at a random house bought Beautiful Eyes. Um, and she was the perfect editor, and she still is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, uh, so that began the, the really, really Jones. So when I finished Beautiful Eyes, even though it had kind of a, a weird ending and it was a, a lie to, you know, left to stand in the book, I, I pretty much thought it was, that was it. It was going to be, you know, it was it lived to fight another day. Basically, was the was the uh, was the ending there. But I couldn't let her go because, the, you know, she was still in my head. I was still hearing her voice. So I wrote um, Sliver of Truth. Um, and then, you know, at that point, it was just a matter of competing voices. There were a number of standalones in between Blackout and, and Die For You. And then um, when it came to Fragile, um, which was the first Hollows book, um, that was a, you know, the, that was the book that was um, inspired by the event from from my past, from the, the girl who was abducted in my hometown when I was a kid. And that story um, evolved from a, a character named Maggie Cooper. Um, and when um, and when her, her husband turned up, Jones Cooper, I just, you know, I didn't think very much of him. I just thought he was, I just thought he was the husband. <laughs> well, just, just to counter that, just to counter that for you, um, an actress friend of mine, uh, I, I said to her, what, what are you playing in this movie? And she said, ugh, the wife. <laughs> exactly. Like, so, and he yeah. wound up being, uh, he wound up being like the linchpin to the whole story, which I didn't know when I met him. And, um, and then likewise, The Hollows wound up being a, a place that had, that had its own personality. Um, and it started to emerge as a place that, you know, not only had a personality, but also had a, like an agenda. You know, and it's not a malicious agenda necessarily. It's kind of like your, you know, your passive aggressive aunt at Thanksgiving. Like you know something was said, you know, you don't know why you feel like crying, you know, like you know, <laughs> it's that kind of you know, that kind of energy. But it doesn't like secrets and uh, it encourages paths to cross and it likes to, you know, unbury its its dead. And um, so that so it's, you know, it's very organic, you know, like, it's the fascination with that place, and what is this place, and what can happen in a place with this, and then, you know, exploring that expands my writing, allows me to go different places, and the hollows allows me a kind of continuity from book to book, but it allows me to get into different people, it allows me to, you know, to deep dive into various different types, and answer a lot more questions, and so, you know, I'm in the hollows until the hollows lets me lets me leave. Let yeah. So I'll turn it over to the audience. Who um, I still have questions. If you don't, so you'd better jump. Yeah, in, really. Right? You better. They better, they better be good too. Because yeah. uh -oh, I'm waiting. No, that's Let's go. Don't, no pressure. No pressure. No. <laughs> Someone. I'm, I'm waiting. The first person's always a little nervous, and then no, because I'm really going to ask this question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. So. so you said that you write intuitively. When you're done with that first pass and you're starting on the first re-edit, the first, mm -hmm. do you then, are you then thinking primarily of structure? What is in your mind when you're in that first? My structure is usually pretty solid in my first draft. Um, there, you know, um, I generally, I, generally like, well, just as an example, most of the time when I finish a book, it's, you know, about 100,000 words, and or maybe, you know, 95,000 to 100,000 words. By the time I've gone through a second and a third draft of that book, it's probably about 110,000 words. I know a lot of people have a lot more words and then cut those words out, but I, I go the other way. So I'll generally write a first draft and put it aside and then um, go back to it and start from page one and start reading. And at that point, you know, there'll be just sort of my edits, my, you know, my ideas, how to flush things out, what's working, what's not working, how do I make it work. Um, for me, there's generally not a lot of restructuring from that first draft in terms of how things happen. Sometimes there is, but a lot of times not. And then, 
it'll go to um, to my to my editor, Sally. Hey, Sally. She's right there. <laughs> and then she and then she takes her. She she reads, and then we sit down and have a long conversation about it. We don't do anything sort of written, so we have this kind of big, talk, you know, like the big talk about the book, and we kind of go over, you know, and she says, I needed more of this, or this didn't work, and, you know, she gives her comments, and we have this sort of, I mean, it's a very long talk. It's, it's a, I love it, actually. I love that dynamic moment where I feel it. I mean, I think every, every author needs an editor. Um, some authors think they don't need an editor. They're usually, <laughs> they're usually wrong. Anyway. But I, I think every author needs a, a great editorial relationship. And, um, and uh, then I take her converse, that conversation and then I just kind of metabolize it. You know, two days, three days, and then I start from page one and go through with her thoughts in my head and say, okay, I can do this, or if I change this, then this is gonna change and I can't, I can't have that change. And so I go through with her stuff and my stuff, and I, you know, I do it again. It's a rewrite, and um, and then we kind of go back and forth like that into line edits. Like then you go down to, you know, it's a sentence by sentence thing. So I mean, it's three or four drafts before it even goes to production, you know, which is copy editing, you know, like all the little tiny, little teeny. My favorite thing, right, Sally? Yeah, exactly. I love copy edits. Copy edits are like. Copy edits are like you've given your book to somebody, or you've told a really long, elaborate lie to somebody, <laughs> and then this person goes, it's a lie because of this, you're wrong about this, this is inconsistent, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. That's how I feel about copy editing. Of course, thank God for that, right? Because if any of that stuff got through, you'd be like getting mail for years, which, you know, I sometimes do get mail about mistakes, but whatever. That's, um, you know, that's basically the process. And it's pretty long, but to be honest, I mean, I just, you know, I kind of really do love everything about it. You know, I love the initial creative process, and then I love all the, you know, all the stuff that, you know, that uh, goes into the editorial phase. And I feel like it's back to that feeling. I can be better, you know, every every day. I can do better than I did yesterday. Than I did yesterday. Um, and I and I feel that way about the editorial process. I feel excited that, you know, it's going to be better every time I go back through it again. Do you want to yeah. get that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said plot and everything else goes from character. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a situation where a character turned out to be substantially different than you originally imagined? All the time. Which is great. I mean, that's the magic of it, right? I mean, writing is kind of like, it's a little bit like improv, right? You never say no, right? The minute you say, the minute you say no in improv, that's the end of the skit. Um, the minute you say no in fiction, that's the end of the book. You know, it's like people always ask the question, like, oh, do you ever write yourself into a corner? No. <laughs> I remove the corner. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know. That's a great yeah, tweet. That, right. <laughs> when you write yourself into a corner, remove the corner. Remove the corner. It's kind of brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, you know, that's the magic of it, right? Because, you know, I do a lot of. Um, talking about like the voices in my head and the subconscious and and all that and all that is is really part of it but of course also you know there's a craft you know I started studying the craft when I was you know seven years old reading my first book and I have spent my entire life studying it in school through my reading and from in anything from plays to journalism to you know to, to film and TV I study story always and um and i work every day to get better at what i do the words that i put on the page how i put them there um and and there is a and there's a magic too the magic of your character turning out to be something totally different than you expected and being willing to go with that but you know the art of writing a novel or the act of writing a novel is a is a union of magic and craft you know some days the magic is there and those pages flow and you can stop them from coming and you know what? Some days the magic isn't there, but the craft is always there. You can always, you know, work, right? And then hopefully, you know, there's more synergy in each novel of magic and craft than, than not. But, you know, a lot of times it's one or the other <laughs> every day, you know? It's true. It's true. Yes? Do you give yourself um, a daily word count? 
Um, no, not really. I mean, I generally write, you know, I generally do um, one to 3,000 words a day, sometimes a lot more than that, sometimes not. I'm not sort of a big word count person. I mean, I like to know where I am in the manuscript, um, but, you know, I don't, um, you know, I just had this conversation uh, actually over drinks with Daniel Palmer and Hank Philippi, Ryan, who's going to be here. And they're, you know, they're big word count people, and Daniel was like, my wife always was like, I don't get the whole word count thing. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, it can't just be any thousand words, right? It's <laughs> 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 like that, a thousand words that actually work. So I know a lot of people are like, I put down my words. I don't care if they're good or not. I'll fix it later. I don't actually feel that way. I'll wait for the words to come. And, you know, I think of writing as a, it's a truly organic process. And um, everything, uh, everything about it is um, like nature. So there's an ebb and, a, ebb and a flow. And after you've been doing it this way for so long, you kind of have, you have to be comfortable in the ebb as well as the flow. Knowing that the ebb is often a gestational period where even if you're not putting the words down, it's still, you know, it's in there, it's growing, it's moving, and when it's ready to, you know, I'll hear that sentence, I'll hear that voice, it'll come back, you know, I believe it, and, uh, and you know, so far so good. <laughs> <laughs> I see, oh, sorry, go ahead. How much do you work on the first draft before you show it? Um, a lot of times my editor is, is reading a little bit as I write, so we're kind of, she's already sort of semi-familiar with it, but I'll do a first draft and then I'll take a break from that draft and I'll rewrite it. Um, and uh, I might even do it again if I feel like I, you know, made a lot of changes and need a little bit more time and then another go at it. But it's usually about two or three drafts before my, my editor uh, is involved. Susan's going to do afterwards. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, please. No, no, please. Go ahead. Okay. Um, when I go to the bookstore, I, uh, I, browse, I browse books by using a technique I, I guess a lot of people use. Is I just look at the first page. Okay. Yeah. Opening paragraph. And I wanted to know how conscious you are about having an absolutely fantastic opening. Mm -hmm. Because that's, I haven't read your novel, but I read the first page tonight. And yeah. I said, this is on. Like, this is in my category of absolutely fantastic first page. Thank you. <laughs> so you? A lot of really good novels don't have a great, great opening paragraph. Well, I mean, for me, I think if, if I'm not feeling that, I'm like so excited to write something, um, maybe my first page isn't going to be great. And I don't know, because whenever I sit down to write, I'm super jazzed to write. And I think that that ha might have a lot to do with it. I am um, invested, involved, and, you know, writing from whatever voice it is in my head. That's what I'm conscious of. I've never gone back and rewritten, you know, and rewritten something just to make it a great first page. Like, I've never done that. I, I feel like, um, you know, when I put when I put words down, they're um, they're the best that they can be, and especially with that first page, I'm always, you know, very sure of it once it's once it's down. But it's never like I'm going to go back and say this is not a good enough first page. I'm I'm going to rewrite it. I haven't had a thought like that. Maybe maybe I should have a thought like that, but I haven't. <laughs> so Susan, so do you ever read books on writing just? For the exercise or to see what's in other people's minds and do you think some of them are better than others? I do. I, I such a good question. I have, a, I have a lot of really, I have a few favorite books on writing. Um, Bird by Bird um, is one of my favorites. Uh, on Writing by Stephen King. Um, uh, oh, the Lie That Tells the Truth by John Dufresne. Uh -huh. Um, which I absolutely love, and uh, the, the Artist's Way by by Julia Cameron. Those I would say are you know sort of the Bibles for for writing um, because you know it's it's not just like it you know none of them are enough, none, none of them are just a nuts and bolts guide to how to write. Um, uh, they're all about the journey of being a writer, um, and and all of these folks have had a pretty pretty interesting journey. And I don't think that, you know, 
the craft of writing is is uh, is indivisible from from the life of the writer. I mean, we're all greatly inspired by our lives and what we we see around us and the experiences that we've had. And, and all these books are, you know, uh, really honest and inspirational and uh, truly um, um, important if you want to be a better writer. So I, I recommend those wholeheartedly. And they also, I think. Um uh, help your confidence, like oh, yeah. the bird does. And, I right, mean, they it also does, because she's so honest about, yeah. you know, sort of the hills and valleys and the, the challenges. And, you know, when she wrote a book and it was done and, it, you know, it wasn't right and she had to fix it. And it's like, it's, there's so much honesty in these books. I mean, because a lot of times, you know, when you're out and about and you're listening to authors talk, it's like they all want to, they all want to, um, you know, make it seem like they, you know, sprung from the head of Zeus in full armor, you know? And it's like, all of us have been on an incredible journey to the place that we are. And all of us, like, you know, and this is just for the, the sort of aspiring, the aspiring writers in the room. Like, there is not one working writer, not one best-selling, not one award-winning writer today that didn't start off as an aspiring writer. Everybody came from that place, and everybody has an individual journey, and I think that when writers are, are honest about that, it's inspirational um, to other writers. Yeah. It's yeah. sort of a great place for us to end here mm -hmm. and go over, and um, not just the first page. I'm only, I have to admit, a third of the way into the book, so I avoided talk, I didn't want to talk about it too much because I didn't want it to get ruined for me. But um, please come over, say hello to Lisa, buy a book, get it signed, um, and then the Crime Fiction Academy people will come up and have some drinks and talk a little bit more with uh, Lisa, who I think we could have easily stayed here for another two hours, right, and listened to. I mean, I, I was thinking there were so many quotable quotes that I'm going to tweet some of them. All right. So thank you so much. Yeah.